Hi, this is Laura Chappell, and this is the Internet Safety for Kids presentation. This presentation was designed to be presented to adults, so we don't recommend that children view the materials here. We're going to start out by looking at some case studies, and then we'll talk a little bit about who's most at risk to online predators. I'm also going to go through the online victimization techniques that those predators will use to lure the kids away. And we'll talk at the end a bit about how to protect your kids. This presentation is available online at www.packet-level.com forward slash kids. In addition to this audio presentation, there are also course handouts. There is a link list that provides you with all of the internet resources listed out in one document. And we have some additional resources and supplements that you may want to take a look at. If you have any questions or comments about this presentation, please feel free to send us an email to kids at packetlevel.com. Now, first of all, I've got to start out with a warning because this material is disturbing and this topic is disturbing. We are going to start out with some case studies that are pretty horrific. I'm probably going to skip through the last case studies because I think you'll see the point of what's going on here. If you want to see the full case studies, don't forget to go online to www.packetlevel.com forward slash kids and you can download the handouts that go with this course. And then you'll be able to see all of the slides and spend a little more time looking through the material. Again, this presentation was not designed to be viewed by children. First, let's look at some of the statistics. Now, there is a statistic that you may have seen before, which is that one in five children are sexually solicited or approached over the internet within a one-year period of time. Now, this report is available online at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Kids, uh, Exploited Children, and you'll see that website listed a little later in this presentation. But the interesting thing is that that particular statistic is from a survey that was done, you know, five years ago. So this trend is certainly moving upwards. And we have seen statistics coming out from other groups that indicate that it is much more frequent than just one in five children. There's another statistic in here. 20% of violent offenders serving time in state prisons reported having victimized a child. We really have an epidemic as the internet becomes more and more common and kids get onto the internet at an earlier and earlier age, younger, younger age all the time. In this presentation in a little bit, I'll talk to you a little bit about a case study uh, that we did, some research that we did, where we went online and we posed as a 13-year-old girl to see how long it took before we were solicited. Here's the flow of the contents. We're going to start with these case studies and then we're going to talk about technophilia, which is a term that was coined by a detective who works in a sex, uh, child sex exploitation unit in a law enforcement agency. Then we will talk about the terminology a little bit, how we classify these sex offenders. We will also go through the six steps to luring, how these predators get online and get the kids to eventually meet them in person because the in-person contact is what the final goal is. Uh, for these predators. They want to get the kids physically. We will also talk about the Cyber Child Sex Offender Profile document. I'm going to show you a piece of that document and show you where you can go and download the whole entire document. And that will give you information about uh, all of these sex offenders that have been caught and put away and what their age was, what their exposure to children was, and what their occupation was, which is sometimes pretty uh, horrific to look at. We will also talk about who's most at risk here, what the age group is, and what the, what the predator is looking for in a kid when they go online and they start soliciting a kid. What are they looking for in that kid? We will round out the presentation with advice for parents, both a set of general advice for parents and a set of uh, advice that is from a detective that has worked with these types of cases, what he would like to say to the parents. And then the last piece there is just the resource list that will tell you where to go to get additional information, get some online games that you can let your kids play to learn a little bit more about internet safety, and where you can go to get additional statistics. And if you're interested in making this presentation at a school or community center, where can you go to go uh, pick up this material and additional resource material? Now first we'll start with the, uh, the Kylie Taylor case, which was really a horrific case. Basically this girl met a guy online. Uh, she had been talking with him in chat rooms, and it's quite common that once you start talking with some of these folks in a chat room, they move to phone calls. They want to talk to the kid in person. Number one, they want to hear the kid's voice and that it is a child. Uh, number two, it's just the next phase in sort of moving along to physical contact. Now, Kylie was 14, and she arranged to meet this guy in person, and he abducted her 
And when they found Kylie, she was chained to a bed. Every time he went out, he would chain her to a bed. Uh, she had been sexually assaulted, and uh, he had been videotaping himself having sex with her. This guy was 47 years old, uh, Stanley Scott Sadler, who, who grabbed this girl. Now, she was located with the help of her, both her mom and a group of pedophile trackers. And the website for that group is www.perverted-justice.com. Here's an interesting case. This one is a 23-year-old uh, Pueblo man who was online soliciting kids through their parents, actually trying to find parents who would help him arrange to meet these children. And the ages he was interested in were age 1 through 14. Now, I live in California, and this is a local case for us. This is a middle school teacher that turned himself in after they found huge amounts of pornography on his local system. And what you'll find with child pornography is that uh, somebody who maintains a, a lot of kiddie porn uh, is, most likely go, is more likely to act out than somebody who does not have child pornography. This case was just horrific. This is a guy that was having sex with a three-year-old girl, and he videotaped himself and offered that video, the live video, across the internet. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to trade that live video for live video of another person who was also sexually molesting a small child. The cases go on and on, and I'm not going to keep going through the cases, but it is just heartbreaking to read some of these things. If you've watched the news lately, you have seen about the physical abduction of children where these kids are, are being you know, snatched and grabbed out of their homes in the middle of the night. They're being sexually molested and murdered. This is along the same lines where we've got people going and being predatory, going after our kids. I mean, if your kid's got a it belongs to a soccer team, it's on a soccer team, and that soccer team puts up pictures of their soccer games up there with the names of the kids. What a great shopping place for a predator. So that's one of the things we will talk about in this presentation as we move forward. First, let's talk about who that perfect victim is. Who are they going to go after? The ideal age is between 11 and 14, but that does not exclude younger and older kids. The younger kids, as you saw in you know, some of those case studies there, you know, they're going after them you know, starting from the moment they're born. The older kids, you know, it depends on their maturity level and how they mature. Sometimes an older kid can be solicited just as easily as a prepubescent early teen kid. They're looking for kids that have little or no parental involvement. In other words, they can talk to that kid and know that that kid is not going to be talking to their parent. They know that that kid can be online at all times of the day and night. They look for kids that don't have a definite bedtime because then they know that those kids are not being watched. That's an indication that the kid is not being watched. They don't have to get offline at you know, 7.30 at night to start getting ready for bed, so they know that there's no parent that's really watching what's going on. They're also looking for kids that can be away from home without anyone noticing. So if they ask the kid, um, you know, can you go drop this in the mailbox uh, right now? Can the kid get away from home right then and there? Or does the kid respond by saying, well, you know, I've got to let my mom know and uh, uh, I won't be able to get out right now because I'm not, you know, I'm not supposed to be leaving my room. I'm supposed to be doing homework, that kind of thing. Also, they look for kids that have exclusive use of their computer in a private area, such as in their room. And you will see on the recommendations to protect your kids, one of the things that's on the top of that list is to bring that computer out of the kid's room and have it in a place where you're more likely to be able to view what's going on and be aware of who they're talking with and what kind of communications are going on and whether or not they're trying to be secretive about their online communications. Is your child's information online? I mean, if you went online and you did some simple data mining techniques, which are reconnaissance techniques, uh, would you find information about your child? Could you locate the school that your child goes to, the city that you live in, your home address, your home phone number, your child's birth date? There is a great training course online that's been made available by HTCIA, which is the High Technology Crime Investigation Association. They have webcasts where you can listen in on presentations just like this one. This is considered a webcast if you're taking this class online. So they have these webcasts online, and the registration is free. When you go to their main site, 
www.htcia.org, you will see uh, a bullet point there that says archived webcasts. You just click that you want to go and check out the webcast. The one I would recommend is the one called Data Mining Techniques. The presenter, Cynthia Hetherington, did a fabulous job. But the focus of that particular training course is really not kids. The focus is in the corporate world trying to protect a CEO from a stalker or something like that. But we can take the material that's presented in that course and we can shift it over with an emphasis on protecting our kids to find out how much information is online about our kids today. Now the registration for these courses is free. You'll simply sign up. They'll send you an email um, telling you that the registration code is this code and this is how you hop right into the presentation. So I highly recommend that you take that and you take a moment to figure out if your kids' information is online. I have on this slide placed a list of some of the websites that are mentioned in that presentation. Uh, anybirthday.com to see if your child's birthday is online, myfamily.com, zoominfo.com, alltheweb.com, and Zava Search. In addition, there is a website called MySpace. And MySpace allows kids to go online and maintain a website about themselves. And they answer very personal questions. So if somebody is looking at uh, grooming your child and luring your child, one of the things they may say is, do you have a MySpace website, uh, website set up? Can I go out there and find out more information about you? And when you go out to MySpace and start looking around and doing a search based on a kid's interest, it's amazing what you will find. You'll see full pictures of these kids. You will see what they like, what they dislike, their favorite color, whether they have brothers or sisters, all kinds of things. So that's another location that you may want to check out, www.myspace.com. Now, technophilia is a term that was coined by a detective uh, in the Keene County Police Department. And this is Detective James McLaughlin that coined this term. And he has a lot of very valuable information online at their website. They run a task force through ICAC, which is Internet Crimes Against Children. And he was you know, kind of looking at the fact that we've got these predators that go and pick kids up in the middle of the night in their homes. We have you know, predators that go try to get the kids at a soccer game or at their school. But we're looking at folks that try to get the kids through online communications. And remember, the key here is that we don't want to stop those kids from having internet access because we want them to grow up to be internet savvy kids to be able to use all the resources available on the internet. But what we do want to do is we want to protect the kids. We want to educate the kids and we want to educate ourselves in how we can help keep the kids away from folks like this. So he termed this, he, ter he coined this term technophilia, which is defined as persons engaging in, uh, engaging, persons, excuse me, using the computer to engage in sexual deviance. Now, of course, sexual deviance is a relative term. You know, it may be deviant to one person, it's not to another. But I think you get the general idea. We're looking at, pred at uh, predators going after our kids. If we were to classify sex offenders, we would classify them typically into four basic categories. We have the top ones here, which are travelers. Now, travelers are very dangerous because they're willing to get up off, out of their chair, log offline, get in a car and drive or fly someplace to meet with the kids in person. And the whole purpose there is that they're meeting them for sexual purposes. So they've built up this fantasy, you know, um, this whole process of being a, uh, a predator here. It's seen as a cognitive disorder. And one of the pieces that plays into that is this fantasy that they believe that sex with this child is going to be so phenomenal and that it's going to be this certain way. And so when they get to the point of actually traveling and acting out those fantasies to meet with the kids in person, that's the point we call them a traveler. Now, collectors are those that are involved in collecting child pornography. And we see that as an indication that somebody is more likely to act out and eventually try to make physical contact with a child for the purposes of sexual exploitation. Then we have manufacturers, and those are really slimy folks. Those are the folks that are creating the child pornography images. Now, they, could, they can be using their own kids to create those images. They can be grabbing other kids. They can be on the beach and looking at kids you know, running around uh, without any clothes on. They can be luring kids and then you know, holding them and forcing them to, to perform sexual acts while they take pictures. A manufacturer is always a collector. But a collector is not always a manufacturer. Now, chatters are the last one on this list. 
And those are folks that present themselves as trustworthy individuals in chat sessions. They just like to chat. They may never become a manufacturer. They may never become a collector. They may never become a traveler. But typically, these chatters uh, do become one of those other folks in there. And that's why we watch out for that. There is a presentation online called Julie's Journey about a girl that chatted away in the in a chat room with this guy and eventually he did lure her, meet her in person and he was a convicted murderer who had spent time and she was unaware of that. One of the key things to get across to these kids is that they don't know who they're talking to. Just as we went online and pretended to be a 13 year old kid from California who was very curious about sex. Uh, we may have been talking to a 25-year-old, somebody who said they were 25, but that person may have been 43. That person may have been 55. There's no way for us to know for sure. Now, the six steps to luring. This is just loosely based on a game called The Missing Game. And this game you can get online at www.livewires.com. And there are three W's in Live Wires there. Uh, this is a fantastic game available in a couple of versions. Uh, there's a family edition that you can play at home with your kids. And then there's the um, workshop edition where you can go and you can take it to a school and you can work with groups of kids. The first phase here is basically saying, I'm just like you. I'm befriending you. If I were the predator, I would be online. Just, you know, you have a, an interest. Maybe you like skateboarding. Well, if I'm a predator, I'm going to go online and say, I also like skateboarding. And what kind of a board do you have? And I may even do some research to make sure that I, I hit the hot buttons of what the, the great boards are, the most expensive boards, things like that. That's befriending the kid. Then, you go, then they go through the process of making the offer to the kid, saying, you know, if you're not happy at home and stuff, you know, gosh, you got to come out here and hang out with us over at the beach. We just have a great time every day. We just sort of hang around here, and there's a you know, skate park right there, and maybe sometime you want to come on over. Now, step number three listed in here is incriminating evidence. And this is kind of interesting because it, it, it takes many forms. It may be that the predator begins having sexual communication, sexual talks with the kids, maybe asks the kids to take um, photographs, sexually explicit photographs of, of him or herself and send those photographs to the predator um, either electronically or by mail. Um, at that point, the kid is sort of wrapped in and is incriminating themselves. And that predator is going to use that against the kid. Now, when step number four occurs, at this point, uh, the predator has convinced the child to meet them, to meet them at a shopping mall, to meet them at a hotel, to meet them at a, a schoolyard, to meet them at a park, to meet them at the beach, something like that. And during the initial phases of contact, uh, this is called the honeymoon phase. And this is where the predator will treat, treat this kid like gold. They will buy the kid what they want. They will treat this kid like they are something special. And the kid will get all the attention that they felt they were lacking in their own life. So at this point, the kid feels that everything is great. Now, sexual molestation may occur at this point immediately, or it may occur a little later on uh, after the, uh, the actual physical contact phase begins. In step number five, this is where the predator may begin to throw guilt on the kid. It may be that sexual contact has already occurred with this kid and this, the predator begins to tell the kid, oh, you know, you really liked it, and what would your parents think if they knew that? In the case of a male predator going after a male child, of course, they can hold that over the kid as well, saying, you know, you've had sex with a man now, so you're going to, you know, people are going to brand you, you can't go back. In step number six, the final one, the truth emerges. At this point, the kid would realize what's going on and that they have been um, lured from their home. At this point, the child may want to go for help, may want to escape the situation. Physically, they may or may not be able to uh, if they're restrained. In the case of Ky uh, Kylie Taylor's case, she, of course, could not. She knew what was going on. Her phases went very fast um, through all six phases. How do they befriend your kids? Well, I'll tell you it's interesting. If you ever uh, have your child online in a certain chat room, maybe you would consider going into that chat room and kind of listening in on what's going on. Although most of the interesting conversations don't happen in the chat room, they happen in these little separate uh, IM sessions that take place on the side, these little instant messaging sessions that happen on the side. 
in chat room discussions, if somebody wants to befriend a child, they may portray that they are the same age. So they may see that the kid announces that they are uh, 12 years old, and this person will say, oh, you know, I'm 12 years old also, and I also like this, and I'm also unhappy at home because I have a younger brother or sister that bothers me. They may also portray some of the age-typical awkwardness that that kid has. So if the kid, you know, is prepubescent, they're going through these phases, they're learning about sex, and they've got pimples, and they're, you know, feeling awkward about these things, the predator will take advantage of that and say, you know, I have those problems too, and it's just, you know, today at school these kids laughed at me, and then there was this girl, and I really like her, and I don't know what to say, you know, those kinds of things. Then they begin to share some secrets, perhaps, where the predator will say, you know, I like um, this uh, one thing, and uh, nobody knows this, and don't tell anybody, please, uh, don't let my parents know that I, I go into these uh, chat rooms and do this, or that I like, you know, certain uh, bizarre what they feel is a bizarre sexual experience, things like that. And they get the kid to open up and share some secrets as well. Now this is the part where they're moving from that befriending technique, they're kind of getting into this phase of, you know, bringing them in and with some incriminating evidence. They know a lot about the kid. Now typically when we were in chat rooms and we were setting up this uh, fictitious child victim, people wanted to talk on the telephone right away. Once you said you were 13 and they didn't have a problem with that and you sent them a fake photo, then they said, well, you know what, I really want to talk to you on the phone. So that is really kind of moving it right along. They also wanted to know the email address of our, our victim. They wanted to, to email and have sort of a, an offline place where they could drop information and their fantasy statements of what they were thinking about this girl. In addition, webcamming is really, really big. Uh, in chat rooms, and you won't be online more than a few minutes before you'll get some link popping up to somebody's webcam, or somebody will have a you know a little icon that indicates that they have a webcam. Then, of course, there's verbal chat on the internet, and that's where you just simply have a microphone. Right now, in recording this course, I have a headset with a microphone on it, and that's what I would use if somebody wanted to do internet chat, a verbal internet chat. Some of the chat room tools that you may find on your kid's computer or that you may want to be aware of include MSN Messenger, uh, ICQ, which stands for I Seek You, AOL, Instant Messenger. Yahoo has both Messenger and something called Yahoo Chat. In Yahoo Chat, they don't have to download any program to the local machine. They actually just go to the chat.yahoo.com website. But with Yahoo Messenger, they are installing software on their local system. Then there's MIRC, which allows multiple people to do chat online at the same time. The same thing that these other chat tools do. I do recommend that you take a look at a presentation online. It's called Tracking Teresa, and it's available from NetSmarts. And NetSmarts is an organization that was created by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. You can get to their website at netsmarts.org, www.netsmarts. Org. And tracking Teresa shows you how this predator is communicating with this kid in a chat room. And while they're communicating, they're actually trying to draw information out of the kid. And you see them flip over and start doing some reconnaissance, some research about that kid to try to figure out what school does that kid go to. I want to be able to pick that kid up at school sometime. And how do I identify the kid's home address, home phone number, the name of the kid's mother, father, sister, brother, all those different things. And it's very frightening to see that presentation and see how easy it is to get information about kids online. Now here I wanted to show you some chat session information. And this is from our fictitious character. And I've blanked out the names of both our fictitious character and the nickname of the person we were chatting with, simply because at this time that character is still active and online on the internet. And we're still using our character on the internet to continue communicating with these folks. But we portrayed this, this character, our fictitious victim, as a 13-year-old. And we see that you know, we were online for just a couple of moments in a Yahoo chat room, and this I am window popped up. And this person just said, hey, I'm 22. M stands for male in Australia. You. And then they put a little character face on there. Our character turned around very plainly and immediately stated, 13 in the US. Now, we didn't identify if we were male or female at this point, which is interesting that this person did not you know, pursue that further. But I will tell you that the name of our character, the full name, indicated that our character was a female, most likely. We had a female's name in there as part of the nickname. 
immediately this, uh, this person came across and said, do you have a picture? And we came back and said, no, you know, we're new at this. Uh, do you have one? Now the ding there that you see was because our character was a little slow. Um, or our character saw that the other person was a little slow in responding. So we sent this little message saying, ding, you know, are you still there? And we sent a message, you know, are you gone? And they came back insistent that they get a picture. And this person went along the communications and continuously asked for a picture of this kid. Now this one um, was interesting. Uh, we have this uh, person we were communicating with whose name ends in a 23. And they said hi. And uh, we turned around and said hi. Now our name ended in a 13. They immediately came back and asked for the ALS. Um, ALS or ASL, that stands for Age, Location, and Sex. Typically you'll see it as ASL, Age, Sex, and Location. They wanted to know our character's age, sex, and location. And we responded by saying, we're 13 years old, we're a female, and we are in California. We asked them for their, their age, sex, and location. They turned around and said, I'm a 23-year-old male, and they turned out to be from the Philippines. They then said, you're so young, is it okay? And we simply said, okay, and they immediately jumped into it. We stated we were learning about chat, and they wanted to know immediately if we had a webcam and a boyfriend. And this particular character was interesting because when we were communicating with this guy, we assumed that it possibly is a guy on the other end, and again, we don't know. That's the whole point of this. But um, this character um, ended up being more partial to younger children. and expressed a desire to not only come to the States to have sex with this 13-year-old, to take this 13-year-old's virginity away, but also to look at uh, that our fictitious character's uh, younger sister, who we portrayed as eight years old. This character that we were communicating with, we pretended we had an eight-year-old sister that kept coming into the bedroom to bother uh, her older sister. And he was very interested, wanted to know the name of the little sister, describe what she looks like, what is she wearing, those kinds of things. This uh, person was more interested in eight and 10-year-olds than 13-year-olds. But they did offer to look into coming over from the United States if the 13-year-old would meet them at some location. Now this one, um, this character, we've changed the name of both our character and the, um, the person we were talking to, the nickname of the person we were talking to. And now we see it in a little different format because at this point we were using Messenger, not just Yahoo Chat. And uh, this person began this obsessive online stalking of our character. And even though we said our character was 13, we began communicating as if we were not uh, 13-year-olds anymore. You'll see some of the terminology, some of the wording in here. We actually became a little more um, blatant about it as we chatted on. But you'll see if you look in, in here, uh, around the middle there, they state that they, they say, I care about you and hope we can meet. I feel sad. Our character said, I don't feel comfortable meeting in person. And they came back with, I haven't, you know, I've never had this feeling with no other girl. I guess we're not meeting. Well, I've got to go. Um, uh, you know, I'm just hurt. I'm very hurt. I stayed up all night writing you a poem uh, about how I feel about you. And you'll start crying when you read this poem. And they finish it off with, with I will die for you. This character continued with this kind of uh, cyber stalking and begging and, you know, what will it take for me to meet with you? I have to, I have to have you. I have to be with you. You're the person of my life. And it's amazing how fast people jump into these very in-depth relationships online. And imagine if it's a kid that's, you know, kind of feeling uncomfortable at home or awkward about their, their bodies and they're growing up and stuff, how easy it is to, to listen to somebody who would die for you, who would give you anything, who thinks you're the most wonderful person, how easy it is to turn around and look at that and say, oh, yes, I'll meet with you. And that's what we need to watch out for. Now, this is a piece of the Predator Profiles document that was put together by the Keene Police Department. And Detective James McLaughlin is part of that group. This is a document, you can get it online, you can download it, and it is frightening to read. This document shows you the occupations, the involvement with children, the age, location, and whether these folks have had a past sex arrest. You will see factory workers in there. You will see priests in there. You will see teachers in there. You will see an emergency room worker in there. You will see that some of these have their own kids or work with kids on a daily basis as a daycare 
employee or as a, a Cub Scout leader, those kinds of things. And the point of this is to know that you don't know who these people are, but a lot of times the predators will try to get jobs where they are exposed to children on a regular basis, where they're, they're able to be around children on a regular basis. So just because somebody's a little league coach does not mean that they, you know, oh, they're doing all this, they're doing a volunteer, how great. We still need to be aware that a lot of time predators try to get jobs where they can be around children all the time. Now, physical access is the goal, and although we're talking about electronic luring, you know, the digital world, going out there on the internet and trying to lure a kid to, to physically meet with somebody, of course we have to address the fact that physical access is the goal, and some people you know, don't need to use the internet to come and get the kids, but we take the, the rules that we teach our kids, you know, don't talk to strangers, we take those rules and we bring them into the digital world to say, you know, it's the same thing, that person's a stranger in the chat room. You know, unless you know somebody, I don't want you sitting in a chat room and talking about yourself and giving away information about yourself. Now, online in the United States, we have the Megan's Law database. You can access this database indirectly through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's website, which is www.ncmec.org. We also can get directly to the individual state's tracking website by going to www.fbi.gov forward slash HQ forward slash CID forward slash CAC forward slash states.htm. Now I know I read that out very quickly, but you can go online to packetlevel.com forward slash kids and you can download the links document and you can download the handouts for this course and reference that and go through each of the links one at a time. I thought it was important for you to know what the uh, U.S. child pornography laws are. Just to be aware that in Title IX, it states in there that it is illegal um, to personally engage in or simulate sexual conduct with anyone uh, that is under the age of 18 years old. Even a 17-year-old, it is illegal. And sometimes it's hard to tell with some of these kids, you know, if they're, you know, 17 or 21 these days, but this is the law right here, and this is the law that is designed specifically to protect children from sexual exploitation through child pornography. Let's start with some general internet safety tips. And now these are just the general tips, and in a moment I'm going to give you the tips from Detective James McLaughlin. Some general safety tips that you'll see over and over again as you research this topic include put the computer in a central location at home. Don't put it in the kid's bedroom and allow them to go in there and shut the door. So we put it in, you know, maybe in a family room or something like that where you can see what's going on and at any point you can walk by. Be aware that if you, you know, every time you walk around the corner and you're looking at the, uh, the screen, your kid suddenly changes the screen very quickly, that's a bit of a suspic suspicious behavioral act and you need to be aware that they may be trying to hide something from you. Try to learn who your kids are chatting with online. And again, you know, take that don't talk to strangers message into the digital world. Uh, you know, we've got a friend of ours who has a, a daughter that's 13 years old, and she talks with her friends online, and I asked her, you know, how do you know that that's who they are? She said, well, because they gave me their screen name, their nickname, and when I talk to them, we talk about things that happened at school, and we both were there, and so we know those things. She states that she explicitly does not talk to strangers, but she's interested in that because oftentimes she'll get a little IM session popping up with strangers that want to talk to her. Now, step number three here, define your personal standard regarding your child's privacy. This is a bit of a touchy subject because every parent has got a different feeling on how they want to deal with this. Would you install some sort of spyware on your computer so you know who your kids are talking to, what your kids are saying, who they're sending email to, whether or not they've been setting up a webcam on your machine? If you are just starting to look into this area, you need to think about this and figure out how far you would go to track what your kid's doing online. That tracking system may eventually save your child's life, but it may also become a barrier between the relationship between you and your child. You know, if your child doesn't think you trust them, uh, you know, that is an issue there that the, the element of trust may go. Now, there are some parents that may want to put splash screens or screen, screen savers up that just say basically that if I'm concerned about your online activity, I'm going to take a look at what you're doing. So be aware that what's being done on this computer may be reviewed by your parents. And just a reminder there that, you know, if I'm concerned about your safety, uh, I will look at what's going on online. 
Also, you need to become familiar with chatting, chat technology, the search tools that are used by your kids, and you may even ask your kid to show you because they may be excited that you're interested in this. So they may you know, share with you, let me go into a chat room and kind of show you what it's like, mom or dad. Um, and remember, this presentation isn't only for parents. You could be an aunt, an uncle, a teacher, whatever. You know, ask one of these kids to share with you what this online world is, is, is about and show genuine enthusiasm, and they will show you more. Ask them, how do I start up a private session with somebody else? How do I know who that person is? How do I see their profile? Can I find out where that person is located? Um, uh, can I get their email address if I wanted to send them something separately? What does it look like when somebody's got a webcam? Uh, you know, those kinds of things. The kids these days, they're great. And, you know, my experience has been that they love to, to share this information with you and show you kind of how they move around and, and what, what they can do in this world where, you know, they have some level of control. Now, from Detective James McLaughlin, he put together a list of things that he would like parents to know. And I think it's really valuable because he's worked so many cases here. First of all, he would like parents to know who's most at risk. And we've talked about that before, that 11 to 14 age group. But don't just discount anybody younger or older. But, you know, it's the kid that's, that's not being watched, that has access to the computer in, in their room in the evening, that can get away from the house without the parents asking questions, those kinds of things. He recommends that you set up an agreement with your kid about computer use, about the hours and uh, access the ch to the chat room and whether or not your kid's allowed to, to provide any personal information, which I would highly recommend against, and especially no photographs. If you find that your child is sending photographs, digital photographs, to a, a predator, um, you need to contact the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And I'll give you the link to that in just a moment. Online at netsmarts.org also, the www.netsmarts.org website, they have some pledge sheets that are already put together. And those pledge sheets are um, geared towards specific age groups. And you can pull the pledge sheet for the age that your kid is and set that up as, you know, these are going to be the rules between you and I, what we agree upon. And uh, you can just use those predefined pledge sheets if you wish. Number three, don't rely solely on software to block or filter content. In a moment, we'll talk about what this, some of the software is and what it allows you to do. But you can't think that the kids aren't smart enough to get around that these days. A lot of these kids are computer savvy. They know what they're doing. And they know that they can go online and do a search on uh, filter, you know, content filtering and um, you know, getting around content filters. There are websites that specifically list each of these content filter software packages and how to get around them. Step number four, or advice uh, element number four, let your child know that reporting unwanted or sus suspicious solicitations won't lead to restrictions on computer use. You don't want to make it so that the kid is not going to talk to you. You want an open dialogue here. You want to try to get as much of this information open and, and as easy for your kid to talk to you about as possible when they get solicited. You want to be the one they come to. So one of the ways of uh, ruining that would be to tell the kid, well, you know what, we're just going to cut you off. You're not going to be able to use the computer anymore. I don't like what's going on there. That's not going to help resolve this issue or teach the kids uh, to maintain their own safety. We've got to let these kids have internet access. We've got to bring up an internet generation and give them all the advantages of the internet. Advice element number five. You should know that restricting communications to a specific list of friends is not necessarily going to guarantee safe communications. If your kid says, oh, I only talk to these five people and they're from school, you know what? Maybe they're from their school, maybe they're not from their school. Again, you don't know necessarily who's on the other end of the line. If a predator finds out what school that kid is from, that predator can make up uh, a name online that sounds like somebody else at the school. Um, the kids may think that you know, they are talking to one person and they're not. And number six, be aware of restrictions at other computer locations. So you, know, you set up these restrictions with your kid and you explain this whole thing and you teach them. They need to bring that education with them when they are in the school when they're on the school computers, they need to bring that education on internet safety with them when they're in the library or when they're at friends' homes, when there aren't going to be any content filtering software packages. The, the key here is to let your kids know, you know, other kids have been lured away. Other kids have been found through this. And wherever you go, I want you to bring with you 
your brain, your intelligence, your knowledge that this type of thing happens and that it's, you know, you need to help protect yourself. Now, advice element number seven, I think, is fabulous. This talks to you a little bit about the warning signs that your child may have been manipulated or may be uh, manipulated by an offender. If your kid shows secretive behavior, as I mentioned before, you know, you come around the corner and the, the computer screen, they quickly change to another screen. Um, if they start deleting the history of the websites they've been to, on the right-hand side of that uh, area where you put in the website you want to go to, there's a little arrow there and you can click on that and you can see the last uh, websites that have been entered into that field. But if they're constantly deleting that, there's never any history in there, that's a little questionable. Also, if you have any unexplained telephone charges, because as I mentioned before, they may start in the chat rooms and they'll go to, you know, let's talk on the phone. Hang up calls, you know, somebody calls the house and the minute you answer as an adult, the, you know, the kid hangs up or the other person hangs up, that might be an indication that somebody is trying to communicate with your kid. You know, all these typical things here. Unexpected mail. You get a mail package for your kid. You don't know, you know, who it's from and your child doesn't normally get a lot of mail. Or indications that your home is under surveillance. You walk out the door and it looks like there's a car there. And the last couple of days it's looked like that. Um, you know, watch out for those kinds of things. And element number eight, know how to monitor internet use in a variety of ways. And that's things like knowing how to bring down the drop down list and see um, the history of, you know, where your kid has been, uh, what sites they've been going to, you know, what programs are loaded on the machine, the most commonly used programs on the machine, those kinds of things. Now you can use some tools to do that for you or you could do a little research on how to um, monitor internet use and you can even put that term into a search engine, monitor internet use and get a lot of advice on how to, how to find that information. If you want to look at what's out there right now um, for monitoring and restricting internet use, Internet Explorer, if you are using a Windows box and you've got Internet Explorer there, you can click on the help button and in help when it asks for the topic, type in content advisor and it will take you right to the help screen to talk about what this content advisor piece is. It allows you to define what sites your kid can go to, what sites your kid can't go to. It allows you to say, I don't want um, you know, certain terms that are sexual terms to be displayed on the screen to my kid, so I want to block those kinds of things. So learn a little bit more about content advisor because that might pick up a lot of little things where you just don't want your kid exposed to those. Now there are some vendors who have made some great tools out there that are monitoring and restriction tools. In some cases they're reporting tools. They'll tell you, you know, at the end of the day when you go in where your kid has been, what they've been doing and whether they've given out their home address uh, to another person. So some of these include Net Nanny, Cyber Sitter, Cyber Patrol, Cyber Sent Sentinel, Filter Pack and Cyber Snoop. And you may find additional ones out there but another warning on those. Some of these kids know how to get around that. They know how to go out and search for ways to get around these tools. So they're not an all-in-one solution. A single password to your computer. Let's say you're at work and your kid comes home early from school. Your 14-year-old comes home early from school and lets themselves in. If they don't have the password to get online with that machine, you should feel pretty confident that hopefully they're not online from that machine. And uh, if they want to get online, they, you know, you've got to be home at least for them to do that. That would be one way of doing that. Also, um, looking at the cache, the information stored in memory of the workstation, and the history information of where the kids have been surfing, as I mentioned before. Those are two locations where you can go and get a little more information about what your kid's been doing. Now, when you go online to these resources that I'll mention in a mo moment, you're going to find that they're broken up into typically three different age groups and they're separated by the grade groupings or the age. So we've got the kindergarten through third grade group, which are children ages six to nine. Then we've got the fourth through eighth grade group, which is right there in our target audience, right there, ages 10 to 14. Then we've got the ninth through twelfth grade group and we consider those youth and they're ages uh, 15 to up to possibly 18 years old. And so, and you have to make sure that when you're going to get, you know, educational information for your kids, you're not going out and getting some cartoony style educational information for your, your kid who's 16 years old. They're really not going to relate to that. So I'll tell you some of the resources coming up here and talk to you a little bit about age appropriateness of each of them. Netsmarts.org, uh, www.netsmarts.org. 
NetSmarts was started by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and they have their own website that we'll talk about in a moment. They have age grouped their materials, and they offer educational material for all three uh, age and grade ranges. Uh, these the group, the, this is the group that has the pledge sheets online. They also have some great videos online from a few girls who have been lured away. And uh, you've got one called Amy's Choice. You have another one called Julie's Journey. And you can watch the video that was done by these girls saying, this is what I thought when I was online. This is what you know, this person said to me. This is what really attracted me. This is why I left. And then this is what happened to me. And this is what I've learned from it. And when you're presenting to a teenage group, those videos are much more powerful than having a, a, a presentation that's geared towards you know, third graders or something like that. There is also a program you can download called i360. And if you go to www.netsmarts.org forward slash education forward slash UT forward slash, that will take you to a site where you can download this i360 program. And i360 has all these different presentations built into it, so you can view them offline. You don't need to be connected to the internet to see the videos of Amy's Choice or Julie's Journey or Tracking Teresa or some of these other presentations. So I highly recommend that after this um, presentation, when you're done with this one, that you go and you download that. Hopefully you have a high-speed link because it is a very large file or you, know, you have a way to get to a high-speed link so you can download it, put it on a CD-ROM or you know, copy it right onto your hard drive and go through the presentation material one by one. You can't go on to the next uh, element of presentation materials in that until you've finished the previous one. So go through all of them. Once you've finished going through all of them, then you can go randomly and select the ones you want to see at any one time. As I mentioned before, at netsmarts.org, there are these, these three that I keep recommending to people. One is Julie's Journey. She's the one that left home for three weeks with a convicted murderer. Uh, we also have Amy's Choice, who was fifth, and Amy was 15 when she left home. And there is also um, a piece called Amy's Story, which was written by her mother, what her mother thought, how her mother realized something was up, and uh, how she felt things uh, eventually worked out there. And then there's Tracking Teresa, which is great for parents that, if you're not really familiar with chat rooms and all, this will show you a little bit about how the chat rooms work and how a predator can use the conversation in a chat room to find out your home address, your home phone number, your other children's names, your name, the school that your kids go to, those kinds of things. Very well done. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, uh, they are the group that started NetSmarts. If you go to their website, www.ncmec.org, this is where you'll see there's an online safety quiz, quiz that they've created for adults and for children. They have online terminology there so that when you see ASL, you'll realize that means age, sex, location, or R uh, F-L-O-L, -L, you know, rolling on the floor, laughing out loud, those kinds of things. In addition, they maintain the cyber tip line. So if you believe your child has been solicited online or has been exposed to inappropriate material, you can contact them. You can go over to www.cybertipline.com. There's also a link directly on the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's website. And there's a phone number that you can call. And I would recommend for those of you listening to this presentation that you write this phone number down, you keep it by the phone, you keep it by the computer, you have it available to you. So if you need to call, if something has happened, you've got the number handy. I talked about the missing game a little bit earlier in this presentation. Uh, you can order this missing game online at www.livewires.com. And again, there are three W's in the middle of live wires. There's a family kit version, which sells for $25 in the US. And there's a workshop kit version, which sells in the US for $80. The family kit uh, simply has a single CD-ROM set. The workshop kit has multiple CD-ROMs, so you can have groups of kids working together. And the point of this game is that the kids are trying to, to find uh, this, uh, this boy named Zach. And Zach has been lured. He went online. He was in uh, chat rooms. He met somebody who does web development also. He's really excited about it. They had a great conversation. Um, then they go th you'll see they go through the whole six steps of luring, with Zach being the target. In that case, Zach left home, uh, went to live with this individual, the predator, um, and then started to learn what it was all about. And the kids that are playing this game are actually acting as a detective, and there's a map in there based on the photos that, um, that are on the predator's website. You need to try to find out where Zach is. And the ideal point here is that you want to get Zach back home or locate Zach before he crosses 
uh, state lines. This is very well done. This game was well thought out. Um, they are in the development process of another game at the time that I'm recording here, so we're waiting anxiously to see what the next game is. But I highly recommend that you pay the money, you go online, you order that right away. Make sure you read the parent's guide first before starting the game up with your kids and your family. iSafe is an organization. They maintain a website at www.isafe.org. They're a nonprofit, and they were formed in 1998. And they have classroom curriculum uh, on all sorts of things, not only on internet safety and chat rooms and all, but also on you know plagiarism online, those kinds of things. But you know, they have a huge curriculum to work with. They have a community outreach program. They also do a certification program. So if you want to teach some of the iSafe courses, you can attend a certification course to see what the curriculum is and see how to teach it. And they also have a youth empowerment program, which is where they're looking for teens and uh, young kids to go out and present some of this material to their peer groups. They're available, their courses are available in all 50 states. You can go online at www.isafe.org to get more information about the courses and when you may want to attend a course in your area. Now our website is www.packetlevel.com forward slash kids and there's a hyphen in packet level. And that's where we maintain not only this audio presentation, but the audio presentation of the Train the Leader program. So if you want to present this material to a community group or a church group or something like that, we have an audio that tells you some of the keys about making this presentation and some hints about making this presentation. So we have the audio course to teach you how to teach this class. We have the audio course of this class itself that you're listening to right now. We have the course supplements. We have the links list. We have a resources list. Um, and our focus is to support the presenters to make sure that you can go out and present this material to other folks, or at least get them to the online presentation to listen to this class. So what do you do now? You know who the target audience is. We know a little bit about the the predators, how we classify those predators as chatters or travelers or manufacturers or collectors. We know a little bit about luring, uh, the six steps of luring. We've seen some chat sessions here and looked at how quickly uh, somebody comes and it doesn't seem to be deterred by the fact that uh, a kid may be 13 years old online and that's it. We've also looked uh, at some of the resources that are available to you. So now what do you do? Well, first of all, I'd recommend that you download and review this presentation with its materials that are available online at packetlevel.com forward slash kids. Besides this presentation, we have other presentations online. We have other resources available for you. We have some statistics documents. We have some hints and tricks and tips on how to deal with internet safety as well. I'd also recommend that you take that data mining course from HTCIA. The full course name is called Advanced Internet Research and Intelligence, but it's basically a data mining course. You're learning how to get information about somebody on the internet. Use that course to perform some reconnaissance techniques on your kid and figure out if your kid has got their name out there on the internet and their address and their phone number and their birth date and things like that. I recommend you visit the resources that we've listed in this presentation. And if you don't have a printout of this presentation or you don't want to print out the whole thing, there's a document called the links list that you can download that has all of those links listed out for you. Ideally, you'll go out and start educating your kids on this issue and explain to them that you know they don't know who they're talking to online and that you're concerned about it and you want to help them maintain their safety no matter where they are, whether home or at school or the library and things like that. We are looking for presenters. We would like this material to be presented to as many people as possible. So we're always looking for people who would like to present this course. We have the slide set available for you to download. We'd love to be able to support you to present this course in your area. So uh, take the materials that we have online. You have our permission to go ahead and alter the materials to put your image on the front or put your email on the front. Um, so we'd be really pleased if, if more of you would take up the role of being an educator here. Finally, if you have any additional resources or any questions at all, please feel free to email us at kids at packetlevel.com. And I look at those emails, and I have other people here, Brenda Check, who works with me, also looks at those emails. So we try to keep up with those emails, uh, and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Finally, I want to thank you for listening to this course. If you have a course survey form or you can print a course survey form out or one has been handed to you, please fill it out and return it to the presenter or 
uh, you can email it to us, kids at packetlevel.com, or you can just email us with your thoughts about this presentation. We want to know how you use the material in here, what was most valuable to you in this presentation, and how should we continue to develop these presentations to make sure that we can work on and educate more people on internet safety for kids.